Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. The clinical occlusal examination includes evaluation of tooth contacts and centric occlusion, left and right working, left and right balancing, in straightforward protrusion, and lateral protrusive mandibular movements. The teeth are in centric occlusion when there are maximum contacts between all the opposing teeth. The contacting areas on all the teeth should be studied. This can be done on the articulated cast, but time does not permit for such a thorough examination of the patient on this TV tape. The centric occlusion contacts on the three teeth that will be used for the diagnostic waxing exercise and their antagonist will be checked. Centric occlusion stops are located on supporting cusp tips, in fossae, and marginal ridges. The supporting cusps are the lingual cusps of the maxillary posterior teeth, the buccal cusps of the mandibular posterior teeth, and the incisal edges of the mandibular anterior teeth. The supporting cusps contact the centric stops, which are usually located on the fossae and marginal ridges of the maxillary and mandibular posterior teeth, and the marginal ridges or cingulums of the maxillary anterior teeth. Centric stops are important for providing a stable jaw position with the teeth in occlusion. Centric stops also establish and maintain contact vertical dimension. For maximum stability, all the teeth should contact in centric occlusion. Also, the supporting cusp tips should occlude on flat surfaces rather than inclined planes. Centric stops are usually present on all the teeth and can be reproduced on correctly articulated casts. Small variations on the articulated casts are acceptable, but substantial differences are indicative of improperly mounted casts. Observation of the patient's tooth contacts in different functional positions is important for evaluating the accuracy of casts mounted on an articulator and to ascertain the best function when doing a diagnostic waxing. A diagnostic waxing will be done on the maxillary right first molar, cuspid, and central incisor. Articulating paper is used to mark the contacting areas. The markings on the lingual cusps of the maxillary first molar are the supporting cusped contacts that occlude with the centric stops of the mandibular teeth. The supporting cusps of the mandibular teeth occlude on the mesial marginal ridge, the oblique ridge, and the distal marginal ridge. The examination of the mandibular first molar shows areas of contact on the buccal supporting cusps. The centric stops for the maxillary lingual cusps are located just distal to the centric fossa against the distal lingual cusp and on the distal marginal ridge. The location of centric stops can be improved when waxing teeth into functional occlusion. The centric stops on the maxillary right cuspid are located on the lingual ridge and the distal marginal ridge. The slight counterclockwise rotation of the maxillary cuspid is responsible for positioning the centric stop of the mandibular cuspid on the lingual ridge rather than the mesial marginal ridge. The supporting cusp's contact on the mandibular cuspid is located on the labial surface of the distal cusp ridge. The worn spot on the cusp tip is not the supporting contact in centric. The nature of the flat cusp tip will be studied when the working contacts are evaluated. The maxillary central incisor is viewed with a mirror. The centric stops are located on the mesial and distal marginal ridges. The position of the centric stops on maxillary anterior teeth vary due to the depth of the overbite. Stable contacts are located on the cingulum or along the marginal ridges. The mark on the mandibular central incisor is the supporting cusp contact with the mesial marginal ridge of the maxillary central incisor. The mark on the lateral incisor contacts with the distal marginal ridge of the same central incisor. 
wear facets are flat areas on teeth that are worn smooth by contacts with opposing teeth in function and parafunction. These areas are useful in the diagnosis of normal function, occlusal traumatism, bruxism, and other habits. Occlusal prematurities and interferences can oftentimes be diagnosed by wear facets. The wear facets are useful for checking the accuracy of mounted casts. Although dental restoration should not replace occlusal prematurities and interferences, they should not prevent the patient from contacting functional wear facets. The wear facets should be examined on all the teeth for function and parafunction. Four wear facets will be demonstrated. The first wear facet is on the mandibular right first molar. Since wear facets are smooth and flat, they do not mark well with articulating paper. Light reflects from wear facets and will be used for demonstrating the areas of interest. The wear facet on the distal buccal incline of the distal buccal cusp contacts the opposing tooth in centric occlusion and during the first part of the right working movement. The second wear facet is on the lingual ridge of the maxillary left cuspid. This facet demonstrates the direction that the mandibular cuspid moves during the working movement. The third wear facet is on the maxillary right central incisor. This facet is located on the incisal edge and is interesting because it is formed by several mandibular movements. Part of this wear facet is formed in straight protrusion, part in right lateral protrusive position, and in wide right working excursion. The relationship of this wear facet with functional occlusion will be observed later. A diagnostic waxing will be done on this tooth and the waxed tooth must not eliminate functional tooth contacts in the different mandibular excursions. Anterior guidance is important for normal function and the elimination of posterior interferences. The fourth wear facet is examined in the mirror. The facet is located on the distal buccal cusp of the mandibular left second molar. This facet exists because of contact with the maxillary left second molar when the mandible moves to the right. The left side becomes the non-functioning, idling, or balancing side. Contacts between teeth on the balancing side are often occlusal interferences because they prevent smooth mandibular movements. Balancing side interferences occur between the lingual cusps of the maxillary teeth and the buccal cusps of the mandibular teeth. When the mandible moves to the right, the right side is known as the working side and the left side is the balancing side. The teeth are observed throughout the movement for contact or lack of contact. The smoothness with which the mandible moves is observed. A smooth movement is a requirement of ideal function. Uneven or restricted lateral movements are diagnostic of occlusal dysfunction caused by occlusal interferences, TMJ and or muscle disturbances, and or neuromuscular disharmony. The maxillary and mandibular cuspids are contacting during the first portion of the working movement. The wear facet on the cusp tip of the mandibular cuspid is explained by the contact in the edge-to-edge -edge relationship during the working movement. As the cuspids come into an edge-to-edge -edge position, the lateral incisors start contacting. Soon the central incisors are incorporated. The maxillary central incisor contacts both mandibular central incisors. Note how the wear facet seen earlier on the maxillary right central incisor is partially formed by the tooth contacts during the working movement. There is anterior guidance throughout the entire working movement. An examination of the right posterior teeth demonstrates contact between the first molars until the cuspids are end to end. Working contacts between the buccal cusps can be observed directly. Shimstock can be used to verify the contacts. Contacts between the lingual cusps must be marked with articulating paper. Observation of the lingual cusps can also be made on cast mounted correctly on an adjustable articulator. A close-up of the first molars demonstrates the working contacts 
between the distal buccal cusps. Close examination of the maxillary first molar helps to explain this contact. The mesial angulation of the molar drops the distal buccal cusp below the plane of occlusion formed by the buccal cusp tips. In this position, the distal buccal cusp is longer than the other buccal cusps and will be in contact, unless the guidance on the cuspids is very steep. The teeth on the left balancing side are examined in the mirror for contact or lack of contact. If the teeth are not in contact, then the amount of disocclusion is observed. The amount of disocclusion or separation of the teeth is important for assessing the accuracy with which the horizontal and lateral guidances are set on the articulator. If contacts are present, the articulated cast should contact in the same areas. It is important to observe whether or not the contacts interfere with smooth mandibular movements, prevent teeth from contacting on the working side, or cause mobility of either tooth. If these conditions exist, the balancing contacts are considered interferences. Contact can be observed between the mesiolingual cusps of the maxillary second molar and the distal buccal cusp of the mandibular second molar. Carefully examine the contact lines of these cusps and relate to the wear facets examined earlier. The working contacts are examined on the left side. The cuspids are contacting during most of the movement. Again, Note the occluding inclines and compare with the wear facets examined earlier. In a wide working excursion, the incisors contact. Working contacts that shift from the cuspids to the incisors are usually in harmony with smooth mandibular movements. Anterior guidance is a desirable concept of occlusion in working excursions. The cuspids do not occlude in centric occlusion. Individual tooth position and working wear facets are responsible for the lack of centric contacts. Anterior tongue position during swallowing prevents hypereruption of the teeth and therefore maintains the disocclusion in centric. The posterior teeth on the left working side are examined in the mirror. The first molars are contacting simultaneously with the cuspids. The rest of the teeth disocclude. Contact or lack of contact can be verified with shim stock, articulating paper, or occlusal indicator wax. Examine the mandibular movement for unevenness caused by posterior contacts. Some posterior working contacts can interfere with smooth lateral excursions, cause tooth mobility, or prevent anterior teeth from occluding. Under such conditions, these contacts would be interferences and require adjusting. Not all posterior working side contacts are interferences, but a single bicuspid or molar contact without simultaneous occlusion on the cuspid is not desirable. Acceptable types of working guidance are cuspids only, group function, which is the cuspids and all the posterior teeth, or partial group function, which is the cuspids and several of the posterior teeth. The right balancing side is examined using the mirror. Balancing side contacts require careful examination since the most posterior molars are the teeth frequently in occlusion. Poor light in the back of the mouth, saliva, and the drape of the cheeks make visual examination difficult. Verification of contacts can be done with shim stock, articulating paper, or occlusal indicator wax. Carefully recording tooth contacts or the lack of contacts in the patient's mouth is necessary for evaluating the accuracy of articulated casts. A detailed analysis of the balancing side occlusion can be made on correctly articulated casts since the teeth can be viewed from both the buccal and the lingual. Note the contact between the mesiolingual cusp of the maxillary second molar and the distal buccal cusp of the mandibular second molar. The mandible should be studied for lack of smooth gliding movements caused by the contacts between the second molars or avoidance of these potential contacts. The straightforward protrusive excursion is checked for anterior and posterior tooth contacts, as well as for even or uneven movement. 
Notice the left and right deviation of the mandible during the protrusive movement. The left and right side lateral protrusive movements are also examined. Any mandibular excursion between the straightforward protrusive movement and the straight sideways working movement is considered a lateral protrusive movement. Note the relationship between wear facets and lateral protrusive movements. Examination of the anterior tooth contacts during protrusion are helpful for explaining the lack of smooth gliding mandibular movements. Notice how the guidance shifts from the left maxillary central incisor with the left mandibular incisors to the right maxillary central incisor with the right mandibular incisors. Even contact on all the anterior teeth simultaneously would result in a smoother movement. Smooth gliding movements can be achieved by occlusal adjustment or correct waxing of anterior teeth that need to be restored. The mirror is used to examine the portions of the anterior teeth that are contacting during the protrusive movement. The incisal edges of the mandibular incisor contact the marginal ridges of the maxillary central incisors. Wear facets can be demonstrated which correspond to the anterior tooth contacts during the protrusive excursion. These facets and their relationship with the protrusive guidance should be studied on the casts from both the lingual and facial views. The posterior teeth on the right side are observed in the mirror during the protrusive movement. The supporting cusps of the posterior teeth disocclude. Note the relationship between the supporting cusps and the occlusal sulci. The supporting cusps should disocclude since their movement parallels the occlusal sulci. The left side is examined through the mirror during the protrusive movement also. Since the cusps move along the occlusal sulci and not towards each other, contacts are not observed. If the anatomical arrangement of the teeth is normal and the curve of spee is not excessive, the posterior teeth will not contact in protrusion. The posterior teeth should also be examined in lateral protrusive movements for interferences. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.